invite you to take and turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 17. Genesis chapter 17, if you didn't bring a Bible of your own and you'd like to use a Bible in the seat, it's on page 11, page 11. If you're new with us this morning, we've been in a series, been in an extended survey through the book of Genesis, and we're in a in sort of a mini-series that we're calling Number of the Stars, The Life and Legacy of, of Abraham. If you, uh, if you grew up in the church, I wonder how many of you uh, grew up in a church that used uh, a teaching tool called a catechism? Anybody grew up in a church with a teaching tool called a catechism? Um, personally, I always associated that, that word with the Roman Catholic Church. Um, I had Roman Catholic friends that after school would have to go to this thing called CCD, and, uh, and I would just go home and just laugh that they had to go to those classes. I'm not trying to make fun of it. I just liked my free time. And, uh, but it's not just a Roman Catholic thing. There are a lot of traditions uh, that have a catechism. And a catechism is just a set of instructions. It's a set of instructions about Christian belief. Uh, it typically is in the form of questions and answers. And this can be a very effective way to educate the church about basic doctrine about basic beliefs, what we believe as, as Christians. And there's been a renewed interest in catechesis or catechism today, especially among modern evangelicals, where, for better or for worse, doctrinal teaching has, has kind of taken a back seat to things like felt needs and, and entertainment and all the rest. And so there's this renewed interest in really teaching doctrine and helping Christians understand what we believe. And so a few years ago, uh, Crossway Publishers partnered with Tim Keller. If you're familiar with Tim Keller, he planted a, a church, Re Redeemer Presbyterian in Manhattan, New York, and they published this. It's called the New City Catechism. It's kind of a modern catechism. It takes a lot of, a lot of things from some of the older classic catechisms, but sort of puts it in a, in, a, in a modern setting, modern language. And there's actually a few of these out at the bookstore if you'd like to check one out. It's this New City Catechism. It contains 52 questions and answers which take you through crucial, important, key doctrines of the Christian faith, like God, creation, the fall, the law, redemption, Christ, grace, the spirit, restoration, living in grace, and all the rest. But the first question is the one that I want to highlight this morning. The first question from the New City Catechism, because it really gets to the heart of today's message from Genesis chapter 17. And the first question in this new city catechism is, what is your only hope in life and death? What is our only hope in life and death? And the answer that you would be expected to be able to give or to, to recite is this, that we are not our own, but belong to God. In fact, the long version of the answer is that we are not our own, but belong body and soul, both in life and death, to God and to our Savior, Jesus Christ. This, I put the kid version on the screen. So it's, a, it's a helpful tool for families, too. There's the long answer, and then there's the short kid answer. And I just gave you the short kid answer. That we're not our own, but we belong to God. Kids could remember that, right? I don't belong to myself belong to God. This is the essence, friends, of what it means to be in a covenant relationship with God. Being God's treasured possession and living our lives fully in His loving presence. That's what it means to be in a relationship with God. And in today's passage, we're going to see God invite Abram, this friend that we've been making for these last several weeks, Abram, who is sadly now living in the, in the wreckage of his own foolish making, right? If you remember last week's message, you can go back and listen to it on the website if you want. He's now living sort of in the shambles of his foolish decisions, but now God is going to invite him in this chapter to live, what I'm saying in the title of this message, Coram Deo. Coram Deo. That's a, that's a Latin phrase for smarty pants who would want to sound intelligent, right? Coram Deo. Deo. It's a Latin phrase which means in the presence of God. To live before God. Before the face of God. 
This was Abram's only hope. Only hope in life and death. Not that he was a winner. Not that he was a successful self-made man. Or the captain of his own ship. His only hope is that he belongs to God. Completely to God. Is that your only hope this morning? Friends, this, this is a tremendous opportunity to hear from God. Every single time we open God's word, we hear from him. And have this opportunity now to, to be invited by him, to live quorum Deo, to live in his presence. And I just want to encourage you, don't resist him this morning. If you hear his voice, don't harden your heart against him. But embrace what God is inviting you to this morning. God has a word for us this morning. In Genesis chapter 17, and so let's read it together. And it's our tradition here at, at Faith Baptist that when we read Scripture, we stand in honor of God's Word, because this is God speaking now to us. These are not the words of man, these are the words of God. Follow along in your Bibles as I read Genesis chapter 17, starting in verse 1. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless, that I may make my covenant between me and you, and may multiply you greatly. Then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall you, your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, that's the name we know, isn't it? For I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful. I will make you into nations and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings. All the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession. And most importantly, I will be their God. And God said to Abraham, As for you, you shall keep my covenant. You and your offspring after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised every male throughout your generations, whether born in your house or bought with your money from any foreigner who is not of your offspring. Both he who is born in your house and he who is bought with your money shall surely be circumcised. So shall my covenant be in your flesh. An everlasting covenant. Any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin shall be cut off from his people. He's broken my covenant. And God said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. And I will bless her. And moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her. And she shall become nations. Kings of people shall come from her. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said to himself, Shall a child be born to a man who is a hundred years old? Shall Sarah, who is 90, 90 years old, bear a child? And Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. God said, No. But Sarah, your wife, shall bear a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his offspring after him. As for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I have blessed him and will make him into a great nation. But I will establish my covenant with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you at this time next year. When he had finished talking with him, God went up from Abraham. Then Abraham took Ishmael, his son, and all those born in his house, or bought with his money, every male among the men of Abraham's house, and he circumcised the flesh of their foreskins that very day. 
as God had said to him. Abraham was 99 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. And Ishmael, his son, was 13 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. That very day, Abraham and his son Ishmael were circumcised. And all the men of his house, those born in the house and those bought with money from a foreigner, were circumcised with him. Let's pray. Father, I ask for your help to try to wade through all of this is a challenge. And so I pray for your Holy Spirit to help me, help us all to see what's here for us today. Sioux Falls, South Dakota, 2020. In the heart of America, I pray. Father, would you show us what this means for us today? What it means to live quorum Deo, to live in the presence of God, to live before your face and walk before you blameless. Show us what that means, what that looks like. May we not resist your Holy Spirit if you're speaking to us this morning, but may we receive what you have for us and take it to heart. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. If you remember a couple weeks ago in chapter 15, you saw that God had sort of initiated already, sort of inaugurated this covenant with Abram, chapter 15, verse 5, look toward heaven, remember this, look toward heaven and number the stars. This is the reason we call this series, Number the Stars. Number the stars, Abram, if you're able, give it a go, give it a shot. Number the stars, so shall your offspring be. You look at the sky now, you're going to see the promise of God. And then God clarified and, and even went a step further and visually confirmed his covenant, if you remember the smoking pot and the flaming torch, that just sort of bizarre ritual, that vision that Abram had. Smoking pot, the flaming torch, God's own holy presence passing between these, these animal carcasses that had been cut in half and laid out as sort of this path and the smoking pot and the flaming torch passed between them as a way of saying, if this covenant be broken, something bad is going to happen to the one who breaks this covenant. Of course, God passes between these animal carcasses alone. Abram doesn't follow him. And God says, to your offspring, I give this land. And with this display, God then declared himself to be the sole responsible party in this covenant. And then came then for Abram's part, we saw in chapter 15, verse 6, Abram believed. It's the key to this whole series. Abram believed God's promise. And that faith, that faith was counted to him as righteousness. It was credited to his account. God put righteousness in Abram's account on, on account of the fact that he believed God. He believed his promises. And then comes chapter 16. And this foolish disaster with Sarai and Hagar. And then the birth of Ishmael. It's a disappointing chapter to say the least. And now, here we are in chapter 17, 13 years later. 13 years have passed. We don't know what life was like for Abram during those 13 years. But I'm guessing it was a challenge. This mixed household now. Thirteen years had passed. Had, had God just sort of forgotten? Abram, just move on. He blew it. He had his chance. We're done. We're going to move on to somebody else now. Would God then go back on his promises? Well, no, of course not, right? If we've learned anything from our survey of Genesis. We know that God keeps his promises in spite of the disappointment the disappointingness of his people, right? So absolutely not. In fact, now, God's going to double down. He's going to double down on Abram. And it's time to make the covenant official. So it's almost like it's been this extended sort of betrothal time. And now it's, it's time for the wedding day. It's time to make the covenant official. 
And I've arranged this message according to six covenant P's. Six covenant P's. Verse 1 and 2. When Abram was 99 years old, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and he said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. So in verse 1, here we see the first the first P, this fundamental covenant precept, which is to walk before God and be blameless. That is what God is wanting from, from Abram. Walk before me and be blameless. A precept, if you don't know, it's a general rule intended to regulate behavior or thought. This this statement from God at the beginning of the chapter, this was how God intended Abram to live his entire life. His entire life. Walk before me. Be blameless. Coram Deo. That's what it means. Live your life right before me. This was to be the ruling principle of Abram's entire life going forward. He just spent the last 13 years living in the shambles of what happens when people don't live Coram Deo. When people don't live their lives blameless, walking before God. Rather than wait and trust God, Abram res resorted to practical shortcuts, took matters into his own hands, expediency, if you recall last week, did what seemed wise in his own eyes, but it had disastrous consequences and it left deep and lasting scars. And so God sort of let Abram sort of let that bitterness sort of rest in his mouth for 13 years. See what this is like. This is what it's like when you don't trust me, when you don't wait upon me. Spending these next 13 years sort of thinking about that. Also that this invitation to Coram Deo would become all the sweeter. Now God says, walk before me. Walk before me. And be blameless that my covenant blessings can now be poured into your life. Friends, is this how you fundamentally see your life? Lived blamelessly before God, ready to give, ready to receive Ready to receive every good gift that your Father has for you? Maybe if we put it in New Testament terms. Do you, by the mercies of God, present your whole self as a living sacrifice? Like we just sang. Present your whole self as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God as your spiritual worship. We are not talking about superficial religion here. When we talk about Coram Deo, we are not talking about just going to church on Sunday mornings. We, the world, can tolerate superficial religion and even celebrate it for the most part because it's benign. Go to church on Sunday, but just don't live Coram Deo. Don't live Coram Deo when you go to work. Don't live Coram Deo when you go to school. Don't live your life before, before God, walking blamelessly before Him. Because when people live Coram Deo, things start to get uncomfortable. In a, in a good way. In a good world-changing way. Now the second P is the covenant participants. So we've seen the covenant precept. Walk before God. And be blameless. Second P is the covenant participants. The first of which is almighty God. Almighty God. In verse 1. I wrestled with whether or not this shouldn't come first. Almighty God. This is the most important thing. The Hebrew for God Almighty. It's, it's El Shaddai. I don't know if you were sitting in the service before it started. But we went ahead and we just knew it was going to come into your heads as soon as you heard the term anyway. So we just played the song, right? You're going to have Amy Grant stuck in your head the whole rest of the day. El Shaddai, the God who acts mightily. 
God who acts mightily. Some scholars believe that that word Shaddai means, means mountain. It's not clear exactly what that word means, but some think it means mountain. It's a picture of majesty, of strength, of invincible power, immovable. And I think that's a really helpful image. There should be no mistake who is the greater participant in this covenant. Being in covenant with God is not 50-50. It is not a 50-50 partnership between two equals. A climber standing at the base of Mount Everest, if they're not a complete fool, realizes that there is a significant difference between them and the mountain. If they think they're somehow in any way comparable in strength and power and try to negotiate their own way in a careless manner, they are good as dead. The mountain is supreme, not the climber, right? Now the other participants, of course, was Abram, whom God renamed Abraham. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, which means the father of a multitude. This is what God has been saying all along. That he's promising to do. Is make him a father of many nations. This is what God says. I'm going to change your name now. It's not going to be Abram. It's going to be Abraham. And I just confess right now. I'm going to struggle with which one to say. Now let's not forget too. That these covenant blessings also included his wife Sarai. Sarai whom God renamed Sarah. And God said to Abraham, as for Sarah, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarah, but Sarah, which means princess, shall be her name. I will bless her. And moreover, and this is the shocking thing, I will give her a son. I will give her a son. I will bless her. She shall become nations. Kings of people shall come from her. So new names, new names for Abram and Sarah, Abraham and Sarah. It's significant, is it not, to have one's name changed? The start of a new life? The first instances of names being changed in the Bible. This was the start of a new Coram Deo life for Abraham and Sarah. Their old names, which they had brought with them from Mesopotamia, from Ur of the Chaldeans, those names, they're not appropriate anymore. They're not fitting for these two that God has now called and now made his covenant with. He's, it's not appropriate. They were now almighty God's possession. They were his possession. Set apart for his purposes. This was, this was name it, claim it theology in the good way. You're mine. And I put my name on you. Unless you think this is something just for them. Revelation 2, 17 says, to the one who conquers, to the one who perseveres to the end, to the judgment through, and has faith in Jesus to the very end, I will give him a white stone with a new name written on it that no one knows except the one who receives it. And so for every follower of Jesus right now, God has a new name for you. You don't know it yet, but you'll know it when you hear it. It'll be on a white stone given to you A new name means a new life with new purpose. A whole different set of priorities centered around God Almighty. And another significant aspect of this covenant emerges. The third P, covenant perpetuity. Covenant perpetuity, that's just a fancy word for foreverness. Perpetuity. And I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession. That's new information. Everlasting possession. And I will be their God. Verse 8. This covenant didn't have an expiration date, nor was it limited to Abraham and Sarah, who were already in the twilight years of their lives. 
The covenant blessing would be carried forward to the future offspring, starting with a promised son who would be born to Sarah. Verse 16. And frankly, this all just seemed still implausible from Abraham's point of view, despite the things that he had seen and the ways that God had worked and moved in his life. It still seemed implausible, and so he laughs at the very idea, doesn't he? And he even had the boldness to negotiate for Ishmael the son that he had already had with Hagar. Make him, make him the promised son. There's no disrespect in this now. If there had been, we would know it. It just sounded too good to be true. What do you do when something sounds too good to be true? You laugh. You laugh. And Abraham pleading with God for Ishmael, his son, that's something every father should do for their son. God wasn't deaf to that plea. Ishmael, yes, would be blessed too, but God said, Sarah, your wife shall bear you a son. You shall call his name Isaac. The irony of that is that Isaac means he laughs. He laughs. God has a sense of humor. You laugh at me, Isaac's going to be his name. And I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his offspring after him. Here's, here's the point. Friends, living Coram Deo means looking at the bigger picture. Looking beyond just sort of our little slice, our little vapor of a life. This little blip of a moment that we live. Living Coram Deo means living, looking beyond that. Looking to generations into the future. Seeing ourselves as, as one part of a much larger story, which is what Abraham was. Just a little part of a much larger story, which includes us today. And we'll see that in a moment. And this brings us to the, to the next P, the covenant proof. The covenant proof, the sign. The sign that stands out so prominently in the very center of this text. The, the sign of the everlasting covenant that will be for Abraham and his offspring after him. The sign was to be Male circumcision. That was the sign that God had appointed. Now, some of you perhaps are familiar with what circumcision is. For those of you who are not, I believe we have a video, actually. I'm so glad you laughed. And it didn't just get awkwardly silent. You just read the passage again. This is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins. It shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. Every male throughout your generations, whether born in your house or bought with your money from any foreigner who is not of your offspring. Kind of makes you think back to Genesis 12 where he says, in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. His promise is for you and your offspring, but others are going to be included too. It's a little bit of a foretaste of that. Both he who is born in your house and he who is bought with your money shall surely be circumcised. So shall my covenant be in your flesh an everlasting covenant. This wasn't a sign that God had just invented out of thin air just for Abraham and his offspring. Circumcision as a, as a ritual was well known, was well known and widespread in the ancient days, in ancient cultures. It was a fertility ritual. It was often performed to young men before they entered adulthood or before they got married. So it served as an appropriate sign for God to, to sort of commandeer or sort of reappropriate for his purposes. Given that the covenant that he had just made with Abraham, or he is making with Abraham and Sarah, involves reproduction. It involves the sanctifying and multiplying of, of offspring, of literally his seed, and future generations. So it's a meaningful sign. And in faithful obedience to God's command, Abraham, at the age of 99, along with all the males of his entire household, offspring and non-offspring, his entire household took the sign of circumcision. Their bodies now bore the physical, 
irreversible mark that they belonged totally to God. This was Abraham's way of saying to God, I'm all yours. I am all yours. My entire household is all yours. Abraham was fully committed. He was all in. And he's now ready to live Coram Deo. Fully committed. All in. What about you? The physical sign of circumcision was to then be passed on to future generations of Abraham, given to all male children, eight days old, as a way of setting them apart for Coram Deo, living as God's possession. And it was a serious sign. Not being circumcised was the grounds for being cut off from the covenant community in verse 14. We see centuries later as As history progresses, and then all the wandering Israelites in the wilderness, they neglected to circumcise their male children. And so Joshua, before he could even lead the people into the promised land, that was the first thing that they needed to do, circumcise all the males. They hadn't been doing it. But it was never God's intention for circumcision to become a mere religious ritual. That's the important thing to see. It was an external sign of God's everlasting covenant and promise to bless his people, but the people were expected to respond by living Coram Deo, to walk before God, to be blameless with the same kind of faith that was counted to Abraham as righteousness back in Genesis 15, chapter 6. So it wasn't supposed to just be an external religious act. It was supposed to be a response of their entire life. Living before God, quorum Deo, by faith. And having that faith counted to them as righteousness. That was the point. And so herein lies what I call the covenant problem. The covenant problem. What the Bible calls the problem of the uncircumcised heart. We see this show up later, like in Deuteronomy chapter 10. Where Moses writes, And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways? Coram Deo, right? Same thing he says to Abraham. This is what God requires of you. Walk in all his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul. Sound familiar? And to keep the commandments and statutes of the Lord, which I am commanding you today for your good. This is Coram Deo living. Behold, to the Lord your God belong heaven and the heaven of heavens, the earth with all that is in it. Yet the Lord has set his heart in love on your fathers and chose their offspring after them above all peoples as you are this day. And then here's the the problem. Or here's the challenge, I should say. Circumcise, therefore, the foreskin of your heart. And be no longer stubborn. Circumcise your heart. Meaning, stop being so stubborn. Stop resisting. Coram Deo, living. That's what the uncircumcised heart was a metaphor for. It was for the hard, stubborn rebellious heart that resists Coram Deo living, that hides from God, that resists God, that says no to Him, that tries to corner Him in just a a little hidden corner of life, and then the rest of life is lived for yourself. That's the uncircumcised heart, and no physical external mark on the body or religious duty or sacramental ritual can change the heart of stone and bring it to life. The covenant that God made with Abraham and his offspring, it wasn't designed to do that. So I close with the covenant perfection then. Now there's a term in technology, if you've ever heard this before, called planned obsolescence. Have you ever heard that term before with respect to technology? It's sort of the idea that You plan or design a product like a computer or a phone or something like that. You you plan and design it with a limited useful life. 
so that it becomes obsolete or unfashionable or no longer functional after a certain period of time so that you'll go buy another one. You'll go buy something better, right? It's planned obsolescence. This everlasting covenant with Abraham and his offspring was, that was established by God, it was, it was established with planned obsolescence. I'm hoping and praying that that illustration works. <laughs> planned obsolescence. How can that be? How can something that is supposed to be everlasting ever become old and obsolete? Well, it does so by perfecting it. By perfecting it. By putting something better, even better, in its place that not only maintains the original precept, which is quorum Deo living, walk before God, be blameless, but also provides the necessary means, which is a new circumcised heart. God says, and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. I will remove, I will take out the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. This is the heart circumcision that each one of us needs if we are to truly live Coram Deo in the presence of God. It, doesn't, it isn't by means of physical circumcision, but through faith in Jesus Christ. This is covenant perfection. That one can now become the offspring of Abraham, having their stubborn hearts surgically, permanently removed by the Holy Spirit and then replaced by a new living heart that longs for and is empowered for Coram Deo living, walking blamelessly in the presence of God. Paul says in Colossians chapter 2, in Christ, so this is the connection between the New Testament and Abram and Genesis chapter 17. In Christ, also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. That's a metaphor for what God does in our hearts when we put our faith in Jesus. In Christ also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the sinful body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Having been buried with him in baptism. That's another metaphor. That's the New Testament metaphor for what it means to live Coram Deo in which you were also raised with him through faith. The powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. And so if you've had this spiritual heart surgery, the Bible says that you are not your own, but that you were bought with a price. That you belong, body and soul, both in life and death, to God and to your Savior, Jesus Christ. And this is our great hope. This is our only hope in life and death. That we belong to God. That we've been invited by our Father to live Coram Deo. To walk before Him in His loving presence as His treasured possession. Bought with the precious blood of Christ. And so I don't know where you're at this morning. I don't know where your hope levels are. But our only hope in life and death is that we aren't our own, but that we belong to God. Has God done that heart surgery on you? Has the Holy Spirit come and taken out that heart of stone and put in a heart of flesh? that desires and is empowered to live Coram Deo. Father, I pray. I pray this morning for anyone who is, is feeling as though their hope levels are at an all-time low. Would you, by your Spirit, cause them to see that they are not their own, but they have been truly bought with a price. That is our only hope. 
God, is that we belong to you. That you have made us your treasured possession through Jesus Christ, our Savior. May we leave this morning, Father, encouraged, hope-filled, blessed by you. We know that our enemy seeks to take these seeds of gospel hope and do away with them before we even leave the building. And I pray, Father, that you would thwart his efforts and that your spirit would seal this hope in our hearts. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and let's just sing as we close. Thank you.